What's up, filmmakers and moviegoers? This is Zach. And this is Eric. And uh, this week is the one. This is the biggest interview that we've had so far on this show. And it was also the most nervous I've ever been <laughs> in an interview. You were perspiring just a little. <laughs> yeah. Dude. I mean, this guy, uh, just next level. For yeah, over 40 is, years in the industry yep, yep, and so much knowledge. I wanted to talk to him for a week. Week, Yeah, I'm sure we can have another follow-up episode. Man, I hope so. For sure. Yeah, so the guy that we are talking to this week is none other than Oscar winner Mark Mangini. Yep. Man. Sound w- artist <laughs> extraordinaire. Incredible interview. What, what are just some of the movies that he's done? Well, he won the Oscar for Mad Max Fury Road. That's probably what <laughs> yeah. is most recent that people would remember. Um, he did the sound design for Blade Runner 2049, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Fifth Element, Shall I Continue? Yeah. Any good <laughs> movie that you liked in the last 40 years, he probably had his hand in it somehow. Well, and here's the cool thing, too, is, is that... So not only that, he also makes these sounds, his sound library, the Odyssey collection, available on prosoundeffects.com. This is 40 and years of sound 40 effects. 40 years of him yeah. and his work, and it's available to the freelancer, to the independent filmmakers, as well as to the studios or anybody that's, that wants to improve the quality of their video production with this amazing sound. It's incredible stuff, and it's incredible stories. And he, he tells this one story about how he ended up being the sound artist on uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture, and it kind of blew my mind, him telling it. And I, I was just, I'll admit, I was, you know, I was kind of starstruck. You know, it, this is a guy at the top of his game and amazing insight, amazing knowledge. And, you know, we've talked about community on here in the filmmaking community, and he, he talks about that he too. He totally and, does. And, and it's awesome. He talks about the reasons why some of these films are so amazing. And it's because of the collaboration of the community of people that were involved making the film. I mean, he's super down to earth, you know, without spoiling the, the interview. Let's just jump into it. Yeah, it's awesome. Guys, here's Mark Mangini. What's up, filmmakers and moviegoers? This is Zach and... And Eric, as usual. Yeah, and uh, today we have a very special guest with us, uh, sound artist... Thank you. Mark Mangini. How are you? Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled to be here and to be honored with your podcast interest. (laughs) Oh, the honor is all (laughs) And sound artist, thank you, Zach, for acknowledging that. That's that's important. You're very welcome. I heard you actually say it in another interview, and I was like, yes, that makes so much more sense than any other, you know, definition or term used for this, you know, this position. It's a little highfalutin, but I prefer it to sound designer only because sound designer seems to have been co-opted in a way that doesn't represent anyone who makes what I call a creative contribution to sound. That could could be a, you know, there's Foley people and there's sound effects recordists in the field and there's re-recording mixers and there are sound designers who make sounds and there's supervising sound editors. All of them are sound artists, and yeah. I want to discriminate. So right. that, that's what that's what I've landed on for now. Sure, yeah, I I think it's a appropriate term, and it's awesome. Great. So right, Thanks. you wouldn't you wouldn't call Michelangelo a painter, even though he painted. You would call him an artist and a master. First at and that, foremost, which, yeah. So that's kind you're of you're like idea. the Michelangelo of sound. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. You're making me blush and you can't even see that on a yeah. podcast. Uh, what, would be your, what would be your Sistine Chapel then? Like, <laughs> what, yeah. Got to uh, get they're, into they're art. They're all here. my children. No, uh, don't okay. ask me to pick a favorite. All right. That's the safe answer. There. I love every one of them. All right. That's yeah. good. That's a good answer. Um, you know, the other reason for the, for the idea of, of the artist is that I, I'm trying to create this sense of community. And I think we're going right. to probably talk about community maybe yes. later where we, we start to respect ourselves as other dis- filmmaking disciplines do that are, are, you know, inarguably artists as well. There's, you know, directors of photography and production designers and, you know, the list goes on. They're all artists. But for some reason, sound has been relegated to this weird place of technician, technical, 
we're not making for some reason a creative contribution we're guys that are more interested in decibels and kilohertz and right bit rate bit yeah. rates and the, those <laughs> are the least interesting things to me yeah. so right. I, I feel like we can start with something simple like we're thinking of ourselves as artists and then let, let's grow from there yeah it lets you have a lot more yeah. fun with the project too I feel like because you're looking at it through a different lens and it allows you to it, not just be well technical yeah, yeah. It, it changes the way you view what you do right that's awesome yeah well Mark if you don't mind and um, for people that might be unfamiliar with your work, can you kind of give us a, 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 a brief as you can history of kind of <laughs> how you how long you've been in this industry and uh, maybe just some of the projects that you've worked on? A few of them we're going to touch on, but okay. um, just for the people that aren't aware of the sound artist, Mark Mangini. OK, thank you. Um, uh, I've been in I've been a sound editor, sound mixer, sound designer, sound artist. Um, in Hollywood for 44 years. My first gig was as a cartoon sound effects editor at Hanna-Barbera Studios, and oh, I'm wow. as equally as proud of my work on the Flintstones as I am on Mad Max Fury Road. And yeah. yes, thank you for that, because I grew <laughs> up watching those. Yeah, yeah, but you're my age, so you probably never <laughs> yeah. saw anything I worked on. I was working on them when you were already a professional grown-up. Well, I, I I like to go backwards sometimes. <laughs> I do too. I, I'm 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 insanely proud of having worked on those cartoons, and that there's some really formative experiences there that we might touch on if you're interested. That I think are are, are essential to understanding how sound design actually works. Yeah, yeah. let's get into that then, because I think a lot of uh, one of the main questions I had was kind of how have you taken what you've I mean, 41 years. How Did I you, answer the first question? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. But how have you taken those those, those first years and, you know, develop them into, because I'm sure you learned a lot just doing cartoon sounds. Like there's yeah. so much to a cartoon is the sound, especially Hanna-Barbera. Well, remember, they start life silent. Right. If ever George Lucas's, um, what, what we call that famous quote of his, sound is 50% of the, of the movie going experience. If ever that were true, it is in animation because animation, all animation starts life as sound first. Right. And images are drawn to it, a universe that I could live yeah. in the rest of my life, <laughs> where, where audio yeah. is preeminent, yeah. in fact. Yeah. So, um, you know, what, what's fun about cartoon sound specifically, not necessarily animated sound, although the joy of it, all animated sound is that you have this very clean palette. You, everything is recorded and constructed under the, under the sort of the purview of the sound artist. So every, you control the horizontal and the vertical. Sure. And you get yeah. to build a universe of sound that doesn't exist anywhere. So that, isn't that sort of the, the ultimate challenge for any artist? It's, you know, the way that a sculptor looks at a, a unformed block of rock and, yeah. and chips away everything that isn't what they want. Yeah, that's, of course. That's the challenge and the joy of yeah. animation. But in cartoon sound, the joy is, is, is in learning those early skills of reassociation. You know, cartoon sound never uses the sounds that would, you would actually hear because if a character gets hit on the head, you don't want to hear. Right. There's nothing yeah. interesting because you can say so much more with a frying pan. Sure, yeah. Like, mong, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah right, I can't yeah. tell you how excited I am right now that we actually have a sound that Mark just created that oh, we just true. recorded. Was that Put clean? Yeah. Was that clean? That's License our, free. It's yeah. 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 our first uh, sound library. And right I think that's, the, that, that's sort of rule number one or bylaw number one for sound design is learning to decontextualize contextualize sound and recontextualize it. That was the genius of a Treg Brown, the great sound designer for the Warner Brothers, Looney Tune Shorts, and Jimmy McDonald, uh, the great sound designer, sound artist for the Disney Shorts, you know, uh, which is see something and imagine what it could be. How do you tell a different story with a sound that isn't what you should be hearing, but what you want to be hearing? Yeah. You know, in, the imagery, of course, lends itself. You know, when in a, in a um, Tex Avery very short. The, the 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 wolves have the eyes that come out on springs. You know, right, right, <laughs> right. There, you you have the um, invitation to exaggerate sound because that can't even happen in real life. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. You get you get a lot more uh, room to play with in in a lot of ways with cartoons, especially. Yeah. But that brings me to another question that I had is. Um, you, you know, you brought up that, that, you know, eyes don't actually do that. So you get to, you get to play with what that could sound like. How often are you adding sounds to a scene just because it might help it flow better 
or it, it might bring a little bit more, uh, I guess, believability to a scene by bring you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're in a house and it, it you're going to bring in that HVAC, even if it wasn't on set. Right. Um, what other types of sounds are you sometimes bringing into scenes to help sell that scene? Um, that's many more podcasts than this one can hold. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Look, our job at its bare minimum is exactly what you just described. Um, the microphone on set doesn't pick up all the sounds you could or should hear to fill out what would be a very believable sound panorama. So, right. of course, they turned off the air conditioning in that office scene, but you should hear it. So you have to, bare minimum, reintroduce all the sounds in a scene so that you create, here's a fancy word, verisimilitude, meaning what you hear is 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 sympathetic with what you see. Bare minimum, that's what we have to do. Now, the challenge is, the sort of design challenge, if you will, is how do you add sound to tell a little bit more? more of the story yeah, than yeah. the things that you're actually seeing. Yeah. So he, he, here's he, here's like a, a really simple sound design 101 thing. Let's say you have a character who's down on their luck. Why don't you give him creaky leather shoes? Because if you don't have much money, you can't afford to fix your shoes. Mm. So you have just told, made a story point that would take with exposition or the writer some clumsy number of seconds to, you know, clumsily explain to the audience, this guy's down on his luck. You can do it with a sound in a, in a split second. Sure. So yeah. you're telling a little piece of the story immediately um, with, with a sound. That's, yeah. And that is, to put it into a complete package, that's what sound design is all about. All sound design is, is telling stories with sound, implied or not implied. Uh, that's that's an incredible example. Yeah, and it's uh, funny because we... It just kind of blew my mind, we've, actually. We've, we've yeah. talked about... Um, in a previous episode where the in the edit process and we're talking about sound versus the picture and that type of thing in and for me coming from a, a music background sound is more important you know you'd mentioned the 50% you know and to me i would even argue maybe 75 can i get an amen <laughs> yeah, and and not just because we're sitting here talking with you but you know imagine and then there's plenty of research that that people have put out sub quality video picture with a really clean sound uh-huh. and people will continue to watch mm-hmm. they'll they'll watch it because they're still engaged because the sound is much closer to to their the heart. heart and their head than than the actual visual picture right. because you're viewing it here the sound is right here and you know the if if the sound is bad but you've got this amazing cinematic visual experience people are gone yeah they're, or, or they're, i'm just muting it and you know yeah. cuz i can't i can't handle it but right, you're going to go wash the dishes y- while yeah, it plays right. in the background right? yeah <laughs> <laughs> well so here's something that absolutely supports what you just proposed um, my good friend gary rydstrom who speaks often about sound um tells an interesting he always whenever he lectures he asks the audience this question if you were given the option of have saving a memento of a lost loved one would it be a photograph or an audio recording of them and universally the majority of the audiences say an audio recording now i'm not a psychologist but i think there are some deep roots in that about what you just talked about is somehow the visceralness because it's a sensation it's something you feel you know the the the, the sense of sight is very different than the visceral way we receive audio. I think there's something deeply rooted in us that feels more close, more emotionally connected when it's sound. Absolutely. But I'm predisposed yeah. to think that. Yeah, you're a little biased, maybe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, 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 I think, no, I think no, you're totally needed. right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of community in sound because you you can. You know, let's just say you can be blind and still be able to hear, and and you can understand the people that you're you're with. Um, but if you can't hear, you know, what somebody's saying or how someone is saying something, <clears throat> or that you know the train that's coming down the rail, or you know, there's so much to that that I think you you feel maybe uh, maybe alienated is a good word, you know, uh, a little separated. Mm-hmm. It feels like um, by not being able to hear. Mm-hmm the world right. in a lot of ways. Yeah. So I, th- I think that's that's awesome. Well, you know, what's interesting um, is that our ears, our ears operate 24-7. Our eyes do not. Right. When we go to sleep, we close our eyes, but our ears are constantly processing information and are vital to our survival. And in fact, 
we know that we make as a species critical decisions on a second by second basis based on what we hear, but we process those decisions subconsciously. And that's why sound is so powerful. It's this very sort of backdoor yeah. sense that people don't give a lot of credit to the value of. Right. Which is really, it's, it's unfortunate that that's the case because you and I know that that's not reality. The reality is, is sound is a lot more important and should be, as an artist, <laughs> it should be illustrated that way it, on equal or greater footing than, than the visual. I don't know. It's, that's just my... I'm sticking with 50-50. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm lobbying. That's yeah. good. Well, back to kind of how you started real quick. How did you How did you get into... I mean, you mentioned Hanna-Barbera. Like, did you have influences that led you towards sound or how did you get started? I know Eric mentioned that you are a, uh, a guitar aficionado. Yeah. And that's... Okay. Is that kind of where you started as a musician? Mm. Okay. I, I, I came to Los Angeles. I dropped out of college to get into the movie business. I, I was deeply moved by the Academy Awards broadcast in 1974. And at that moment, I realized, though I was a guitarist then and playing in bands, I wanted to be in the movie business. But I I hedged my bets and I came to LA with all my guitars thinking I'm going to make a go either as a musician or as a as as su as a worker in the sound in in the film business. Sure. And at at 19 years old when I came here I didn't know people do what I do for a living. But uh, my dad got me an interview with an executive at Hanna-Barbera uh, just to introduce me. And we hit it off and he said, if anything came up, he would give me a call. And the first thing that came up was a training program in the sound department. Um, I was ready to become an, a, a, an apprentice animator. I was ready to, wow. to become an apprentice camera wow. person. I, I didn't care. Yeah. I just loved movies. And all that mattered to me was I wanted to work in movies. Uh, the first job that came up in sound, and, it, and in a way it's almost um, providential because yeah. I, have a, I had a great, my music training as a guitarist and as a songwriter and playing in bands made me ideally suited in sound, so much so that I was put in a training program. Nobody gave me a job, and I, I graduated at the top of my class, and they instantly gave me a job because they saw I had oral acuity. I was really yeah. good with listening. Sure, yep. Uh, any musician would, I suppose, and you'll probably discover that many of the great sound artists in our business have an earlier life as a musician, perhaps. Now, was there a specific movie from that that uh, Oscars broadcast that, that you resonated with or that you were cheering on that really... Cuckoo's Nest. It oh. was that. It was oh, the year of Cuckoo's Nest. Yes. One of, still to this day, oh, one of the of great motion pictures of deeply moved. What moved Absolutely. me, that movie moved me deeply emotionally about the stories of those characters. And I, I kind of connected and empathized and I thought, I have to be a part of a business that does that. Right, and you just wanted to punch oh. nurse, nurse Ratchet yeah. in the face. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. Yeah. I will strangle her oh, personally. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it was funny. We had this conversation just a couple of weeks ago. Yep. We were talking about top fives, and that uh, was my, that it's, one it's flow in, of the Cuckoo's Nest was my number yeah, one. Yeah, it's one of the greats. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to get into my top five with him <laughs> sitting here. So I think you're on, I think you're on three of them. So, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, Raiders, obviously, that's... How, how did you get into, I'm, I'm just going to ask it because I'm here. How did you get into the Raiders crew and kind of where were you at, um, I guess, when that happened? I mean, were you work, were with a, a company similar to this or were you uh, freelance or contract? Um, I'll tell you the story. Yeah. It, it might take a minute or two. That's fine. It, I hope it's interesting. But um, I, in the middle of working at Hanna-Barbera and being very happy there, I saw Star Wars and the work of Ben Burt, you know, one mm -hmm. of the great yep. sound artists, yeah. sound designers of all time. And I still think to me is at the top of the, 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 the heap. Um, and, I, and that's when my light bulb went off and I thought, oh, my God, people that do what I do can do something extraordinary like that. They can make an – and I re all of a sudden realized, oh, man, I'm in a machine. I'm at this TV factory. Right, yep. I want to do that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that day I said, I'm getting out of here and I want to go work on real movies. So that was a big moment for me. Wow. So I quit and um, a friend of mine got me an interview at Paramount Studios and I got a job at Paramount as an apprentice. I moved backwards from sound editor to apprentice. But I was lucky in that I got to apprentice with a lovely uh, senior member there named Sean Hanley, who was my mentor for a year. And 
oddly, he was working on Star Trek The Motion Picture, oh, which yeah. was my first movie. And I was apprenticing him, and he was an ADR editor, the person who brings actors into studios and records their voice over again to mm -hmm. get a clean version of it. Yeah. And I was apprenticing with him. Uh, as fate would have it, he got very sick and had to leave Star Trek. And when Robert Wise, the great Robert Wise, asked him, who's going to take over? He said, take the kid. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Over, over 10 other guys who had sen massive seniority at Paramount sure. Studios. Wow. I couldn't believe it. He handed me the reins of the Star Trek franchise. Yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. So in the process of doing so, I met my future part business partner of 40 years, Richard Anderson and Stephen Hunter Flick. And I, so I got to work with them on Star Trek The Motion Picture. That went really well. And when the movie was over, we all decided, you know, working for the studios is a real drag. Let's strike out on our own. So we rented some rooms in Hollywood at the old Technicolor facility. And we put a shingle out and just said, we are sound editors for hire. And wouldn't you know it, Richard's old um, university friend, Ben Burt, called him and said, Richard, uh, Steven Spielberg doesn't want to do Ra Raiders of the Lost Ark in um, San Rafael, where Lucasfilm Sprocket Systems is located. Right. Um, we're going to need to do it in L.A. Do you want to do Raiders of the Lost Ark? And Richard said, well, yes. <laughs> and we had happened to just banded together as a team so my second movie was Raiders of the Lost Ark. So I was as green as they get. Yeah. And uh, I got the opportunity to work with Richard Anderson and Stephen Hunter Flick and Ben Burt on my second movie. Wow. And they invested in me and they made me a full sound effects editor yeah. on Raiders. And it was an amazing experience. Oh, that's that's such an incredible and, and they, story. And it was a movie made in ways that just movies don't get made anymore. Right. So, for example, to make everyone crazy jealous for all you modern sound effects artists, Michael Kahn, the film editor, knew that he had to lock picture 10 weeks before the mix. That never happens. Wow. Um, lock picture. <laughs> because you had to, because sound had to do its job without any fussy interruptions of, well, we should take that scene out and let's change oh, that close up. Wow. No, yeah. this, these were the rules you lived by back in those yes, days. Yes. Wow. wow. Uh, I mean, when was the last time you had that much time on anything? Of that scale, I guess. I mean, uh, well, um, I I have had that amount of time on a number of films, but I haven't had locked pictures since. Oh, okay, right. Ten weeks before. The, Gosh, I mean, I, you know, Raiders we were on for about six months, but I've been on films longer. A Mad Max Fury Road I was on for seven or eight months. Okay. A Blade Runner twenty forty nine I was on for nine months. Right. Uh, the upcoming movie that has a lot of sand in it, I'll be on for about 10 months. <laughs> okay. okay. Cryptic, not yes. very much, but yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. Love it. Love that <laughs> Easter egg right there. It's That's so good. Fantastic. Now, what do you think, what do you feel like, or from your perspective, what do you feel like that was when, when he turned to, turned to him and said, hand it to the kid? I mean, that's a huge, with all these other guys that have yeah. the seniority and maybe not yeah. seniority, but even more experience and more reps. Yeah. What, how, what do you feel like it was about, about that moment or, or about what you were bringing to the table that, that made him turn to you and, and I, he's since passed away and now I have this moment of real deep regret that I never asked him hmm. be, because it's a really interesting question one that might might have even been in violation of a union rule as far as oh, I know wow. because sure. of seniority you sure. know that's a, that's a big part of sure. of you know union control so I, I can only egotistically surmise and this has no basis in fact that he and I worked very closely you know it had a practical side and that was this all my training for months and months was assisting him on just that film. I knew where, you know, to use a, a, a phrase, I knew where all the bodies were buried. Right. So yes. if Robert yeah. Wise asked, you know, where's Captain Kirk's ADR line for scene 17? I didn't have to go foraging for it. Right. I could answer questions quickly. So surely there was a practical component to it. Yeah. And then I think, oddly, for a gentleman who was part of the Hollywood establishment, he was a real old timer, I think he recognized, and he would never admit it to his peers, that the kid had ways of doing things that the... The, the traditionalists wouldn't do. Sure. And right. I think he liked my youthful approach to yeah, this. Yeah. And he knew, you know, I think he also knew, as I would discover later from other friends, that I had a real serious work ethic. 
I, I'm like a pit bull with a bone. Right. You know, <laughs> give me, yeah. give me yes. a challenge, yeah. and it's not going to get unsolved. I, I won't. I won't shy away from a challenge. So th- that, that's my. Those are my guesses. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And work ethic is so. Um, it seems like in this day and age, is there's a resurgence of of emphasis on work ethic because. Huh. At least has it ever gone out of style? I don't think it has. (laughs) Let's talk about that for a second. It it hasn't gone out of style. I think for the people that are 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 operating on on your level and on professional levels, they understand that. That's that's a that's a fundamental uh, component of how you get to that level. Agreed. Um, But I know there's a lot of. social chatter and static um, culturally that is maybe taking the old adage of work smarter, not harder to, to a different place. Oh, that's and, re- and so they're in, in that they're like, Oh, well, I, I've got all these technological tools and, and things at my disposal. I can just go and be done. And, and so that, that uh, that grit that comes from that hard work and that it pays and off. That, yeah, absolutely, a hundredfold what this quote unquote working smarter. And I don't think for me, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. They are not. I, yeah. I, I, you're describing something that's really interesting, and I actually lecture about. I think at, one of the things I've learned as I've aged is to work smarter, not necessarily harder. Right. But that pendulum swung a little too far in the smarter direction, and we have to do a little course correct because I can speak unequivocally to this notion that my greatest successes are a 50-50 amalgam of working smart and working hard. Right. You and, can't leave yeah, out yeah. The, the work hard. Com- nothing that I've done that's any good at all has lacked the work hard component. Right. It's always a process of just being that pit bull, you know, sure. <laughs> chewing on it and chewing on it and chewing on it. I'm going to solve this design problem. I didn't do it this week, but I'll do it next week. And I'm going to stay yeah. all weekend if I have to, to solve it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you're still recording, right? That's our second palette sound. <laughs> in, yeah. Uh, in the, pit bull. We got a pit bull <laughs> sound effect. pit bull sound. <laughs> all right. Our library is growing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've it's, always wanted to yeah. do a movie where I could do all the sound effects vocally. Oh, you yeah. know, the winds and the chin socks and the pit bull. Well, I, I just yeah. think that would be a goofy sound that would experiment. Be, that would be, uh, yeah, an experiment for sure. That's a good way to put that. Uh, I'd love to talk processes for a second. Um, how early in a project are you coming in or your team coming in to a film? Like, l- let's say Blade Runner 2049. Right. How early were you guys brought into that process? Um, were you on set at all to see kind of... Uh, the, the set dressing and everything to kind of see what other sound effects you might use or how, how what did that process look like? Well, let me f- start by making a, a broad brush statement. Uh, the, um, the, the smartest directors and the best results are achieved by the earlier you bring on sound, the earlier you bring on sound, the more accomplished your track will be. Mm. As we said, the whole 50-50. Right. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, and I can say that is certainly the case in Blade Runner and Mad Max and and any one of a number of films. So I'll, I'll give you an example. The film I'm on today is a is a, a small drama with Ben Affleck directed by Gavin O'Connor. Uh, the kind of it's being made by Warner Brothers, but the kind of movie that the studio stopped making. F- Five years ago, they abdicated right. this ground. They ceded this ground to the streaming and cable companies because they want to concentrate on superhero movies. Yeah. But Warner Brothers is making this beautiful movie. Now, Gavin O'Connor, who I've done four films with, will call me as early as the screenwriting phase. Wow. Because he knows how powerful, how narrative sound can be. And he will say things like, Mark, I'm in the middle of working on a scene. I'm here with my writing partner. We're having trouble with this scene. I don't know that sound can solve this, but I just thought I'd call you and ask your advice on can sound move the story forward in a way I can't do with words? Mm. How powerful is that? Yeah. That, yeah. that a filmmaker. So on this film, he didn't do that on this film, but he's done it on past films. On this film, he got this notion that, and it's not a new notion, but it's a, still a pretty uh, novel one, that the composer and the sound designer should work together. So he brought on the composer, Rob Simonson, before production started, before he started filming and started pitching the story ideas to Rob and I and said, I want you guys to get together and talk about how music and sound are going to inform this movie and inform this edit. Mm. And that is exactly what we did. And that is exactly what 
we did on Blade Runner 2049 and on Mad Max Fury Road. On Mad Max, um, uh, George Miller uh, brought on sound. Well, to give George credit, George is the only gentleman I know who put on a second unit sound crew. So all during production, he had a team of three sound professionals recording all those vehicles. Those right. vehicles were real. They weren't those, you know, that big truck had two, you know, Furiosa's yeah, yeah. war rig had two engines in it and it made real sound right. and all those crazy vehicles. And we wanted to capture all because they had great mufflers and they sounded yeah, gnarly and big yeah. and ballsy. Yeah. And uh, Ben Osmo and um, I'm going to forget the other gentleman's name. Uh, who did the recording, they captured all this sound during production. And then that carried on, and, and then George put on sound from the first day of, of, of after principal photography, as did um, Denis Villeneuve during the shooting of um, Blade Runner 2049. And he brought in my a design partner, Theo Green, during production, and Theo was designing sounds of Blade Runner as Joe Walker, the film editor, was editing. Which imp- I mention that, I diverge on that, because Joe will tell you, and any editor will tell you, that Theo's sound design, this is even before I was brought on, was informing the edit. It was changing the edit wow. in ways that wouldn't have happened if there were no sound designer on the film. Right. And so yeah. it made the edit different and arguably, inarguably, better. Sure. Because sound yeah. and picture were now working together. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's so much to that movie that even the way that George wanted to frame up everything, you know, center framed, you know, yeah. for the symmetry so you could follow the action right. um, with all the cuts. Because, I mean, that movie is so fast. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, bringing that sound in. So that, that that's, that's amazing to hear. And George, yeah. um, George had a great quote during our mix. He said, um, Mad Max Fury Road is a film we see with our ears. Yes. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Because <laughs> as you know about his, his, his the, the sort of visual preponderance where he was, he, refra- he reframed every shot yeah. so that the audience knew where to look. And we applied the same psychology uh, to sound. There's so much going on visually. The frame was still very dense with information, but we had something he called the... Um uh, top of the pyramid. Top of the pyramid was the one sound that was the focus of what he wanted you to see. So ha- sound helped you see the mm. thing he wanted okay. you to focus yeah. on. So there was always one primary sound and below it might be two secondary sounds and maybe three tertiary sounds and then everything else was clutter. So we always, ha- every shot of the film had sonic and visual focus. And that is the recipe for the su- success of all films. Oh, I don't goodness. think yeah. George invented this but he was bright enough. He's such a brilliant man to leverage it every minute in every shot of the movie. Sure. Is there a certain sound effect from that film uh, or even any of your other films that you're like particularly proud of or that um, maybe came across in a very unexpected way that you can think of? Well, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, sure. I know that none of them are, yeah, are um, conventional. There's an entire library. It's called there's the Odyssey <laughs> yeah. Collection. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the, you know, I have so many favorite sounds that this could go on forever. Um, my favorite sound, well, the, oh, there's so many. One of my favorite moments in Mad Max Fury Road is not of my doing. It's the moment after the big chase through the storm, uh-huh. and it's dead quiet, and all we see is a little hillock of sand. Yeah. And um, uh, Max wakes up. You don't even know what you're looking at until in slow motion he right. erupts out of the yep, sand and right. all the sand dribbles off his head. Mm-hmm. This is something that my uh, partner David White designed and edited. Just all the sound of that, the little beads of sand slowly yeah, right. falling out. I just love that moment in that movie. I don't know why. It just tickles me. Um, in... Um, in Blade Runner, you know, one of my te- I, I try to apply techniques in every film that help me grapple with the creative challenges. In every film, it's a different technique. On um, on um, wait a minute, no, about going back to Mad Max Fury Road, the technique I I tried to apply was a literary one. I saw um, Mad Max Fury Road as an allegory, and I used um, Moby Dick as as my literary tool because to me. Um, the war rig, the truck was the great white whale. Sure, oh, yeah. And then sure. Morton Joe was Ahab, yeah. okay, obsessed yeah, and yeah. possessed yeah. with killing the whale. Yeah. Yeah. Arguably, that's what the whole movie is about. 
about. Right. So then it hit. So then my challenges started to sort of present uh, present themselves with answers. Well, then if the war rig is the great white whale, let's make it sound like a whale. So we imbued the truck sounds. We had real truck sounds, but we underlaid them with humpback whale groans and moans. So much so that wow. by the end of the movie, when the truck di- finds its demise yeah. in slow motion, yeah. all of that is animal sounds, the sounds of animals dying. Because huh. we didn't want it to be literal or diegetic. It's the death. It's its swan song. It's sure. its death throes. Yeah. So we completed that analogy, that literary analogy, the death of the great white whale with the sounds of a dying beast, not the metallic clangor of crunches and bangs and right, right. those kinds of sounds. And I think that worked on a, a, a beautifully sort of subconscious level with the audience to say, okay, he's dead, yeah. not the truck crashed. And right. so, and look, they're shooting literal harpoons right, 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 into yeah. this yeah, right thing. In the back. Of course yes. it's a whale. Yeah. So yeah. every time yeah. it, the harpoon yeah. went into the truck full of milk, I put, you know, blowhole sounds from a whale just to try to further the metaphor. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that that's an incredible Yeah. Sorry. I'm just <laughs> I'm just very taken by that. It's it's an amazing way to look at it and and um, to attack that that project, I think that's that's just amazing. Well, and there, and it, what, what's genius about that? What resonates with me as you shared that story is is that it's the whale is a living creature. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a living, breathing thing that there's a relational uh, connection with, with with other living things being us as human. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that you, so you've developed this relationship from start to finish right. in, in, in introducing the, I mean, that's Well, think of the genius. other sociological metaphors. Yeah. If you're a liberal like I am, killing whales is wrong. And of course, sure. we're rooting for the hero, which is Furiosa riding the whale. Sure. Let the whale go. Sure. We're all saying psychologically, I think. Yeah. And that makes a Morton Joe, the Ahab character, the bad guy. Right. right. Yeah, you're yeah. selling that story yeah. even more with yeah, it's just sound effects, right? this whole other yeah. emotional Yeah, yeah, yeah it's right. genius. Um, how how is it coming into because these are these are sequels to to I guess you can call them franchises. Um, Mad Max has had four now, yeah. but how is it to try and still capture the the vibe, especially with Blade Runner? It's such an iconic film, that original one. Yeah. How is it coming into a project and and still? bringing the spirit of the original, but um, making your own voice and own ideas mm-hmm. in the new one. Well, that was a really fun process and something I, I, I kind of dreaded leading into it. Uh, we were determined, we meaning Theo Green and I, um, we were determined to have this be a unique and singular work. Uh, so to that end, we had agreed, and you used, because uh, you're smart and you do this for a living, <laughs> you use the term spirit because that's a term Theo and I used very often. We were we intended to and succeeded in not using a single sound from the first film, very intentionally because this wow. is a, a, a movie 30 years hence. Sure, right. And we wanted this to have a unique voice, and yet we wanted the audience to feel it reminiscent, to feel the spirit of the first mm-hmm. movie, but not be a rehash of it. Mm. So mm-hmm. Theo and I um, analyzed the the first film in great detail. We we got the uh, separate the stems the separation tracks of the first film so we could hear the sound effects without the dialogue and music and vice versa so we listened and analyzed all the components to figure out to deconstruct it and deconstruct it and understand what made Blade Runner the first film sound the way it did Uh, and how can we honor that in spirit without mimicking it and the first thing that we discovered that was quite a revelation is that a lot of the atmospherics that you might attribute to the sound designer were in fact soundscapes that Vangelis had created that have, they're just, they're like atmospheres in Deckard's apartment right. and yeah. Yeah. anywhere you would go. Vangelis had this kind of tonal atmospheric stuff that had no melodic or rhythmic component to right. it at all, but gave you a feeling of being in a unique universe. And that was Theo's and my big takeaway, among others, 
uh, that that was the approach to take. We were going to design a universe that sounded like Blade Runner, and we were going to ensure, and this was with Denis' approval, in fact, Denis, in an elliptical way, came back to that by charging Theo and I to, quote, design or, sc- excuse me, score the movie with sound. Okay. So yeah. this all began to fit into an approach to the film, which hmm. was we were going to design the sound of a scene or the film such that the audience couldn't hear and shouldn't hear or appreciate or understand or even think about, was that a sound effect or a music cue? We just wanted it all to be the sound of the Blade Runner universe. And this was the challenge of of um, us as composers right. and the challenge mm-hmm. for the actual composers, um, uh, Ben Walfish and uh, Hans Zimmer, to work within what Theo and I had done to create these seamless blends, which is something we worked a, a great deal at achieving. So did uh, Hans is, uh, where is he located? He's in the UK? or No, he's here. He's here? He is well, he here. He works okay. all over the world. Well, but he sure, has a, right. He has a, 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 a place in Santa Monica. Okay. So you guys are collaborating a lot with that. I mean, because, yeah, I mean, that's another thing I was going to actually bring up was the the Hans Zimmer score and the score in general is so sound effect heavy. And that, so that's both yeah. of, I mean, all four of you guys, I guess, really coming together and, and making that. Well, uh, first, um, I have to be clear. Um, Unfortunately, I don't want to get into the Johan Johansson story, sure. except to use it to illustrate that um, Hans and Ben were brought in kind of much later in the process than might traditionally be the way you would do it to give them the time to collaborate very closely with Theo and I. We didn't have that time. What we did have the time to do was begin that process of of composing with sound so that when it was handed over to Ben and Hans kind of at the last minute, they knew what we were already doing and they kind of worked against, I shouldn't say against, with what we had done so that that became seamless because quite honestly, they didn't have time to write a cue and come back to us and say, what do you think? Oh, no, sure. you better change. We, <laughs> sure. they, just, they just did an awesome job in yeah, a very yeah. short amount of time, knowing that we had already made, done two or three temp mixes, and Theo and I were pretty solid in our approach, and they could hear, oh, you guys are doing that? Okay, we'll do this, so yeah. that it feels good and it dovetails nicely. That's okay. And, yeah. and in, that, in that process under... Normal, normal. That's, you know, I don't know if there is a normal usually, but how in that collaboration, because I think community and collaboration is is so key to the success and, um, you know, in the end of the final story that's being presented um, with your your sound art and the composing that you're doing and with the the film score and the composers that are doing the score how what does that usually look like what is or is there a norm <laughs> I, I would say the norm is um, the work is compartmentalized mm. in an inefficient in uncreative way yeah uh, for no other reason than it's mandated by time and money pressures sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. and uh, if, if you can manage any amount of collaboration that's a win yeah um, you know I'm trying to on every film I do advocate for a different process and I'm, I'm having more and more success as time goes by and at, and I'm lecturing about this at film school so you know I hope 20 years 20 years hence it will be second nature for the composer right. and the sound designer to meet and talk early on and develop ideas with the with the director yeah it's interesting i've heard from a couple of different i didn't go the film school route i kind of worked as a grunt on different projects and documentaries and shorts and things of that nature so I don't have like the traditional, it's, it's kind of been thrown, uh, I've been thrown into, yeah. into that figure space yeah, and figure it out, um, where Zach went to film school and we recently had another interview with a freelance editor that's, that's recently out of film school, like within the last year or two. And I've heard different aspects of, well, you shouldn't edit, like he was, that episode was based on editing. And so he's saying you shouldn't edit to sound or to the to the score or to that type Uh of thing and and i thought that was an interesting approach because 
on on the other hand, the the experience that I've had is you absolutely want to edit to the score or to the sound because of the emotion. The emotion is going to come more powerfully from the sound, and that edit should and they should work together to yeah, support that. Yeah, there's rhythms inherent right. in the music. Yeah, you and those might beats cut are the, the, so they would inform the rhythms yeah. of the cuts. Right, I, I would like to think. Yeah, although you know, it's funny, Denis. Most really good directors I know try to build their first uh, edit of the film without music for this reason. They're, they're not going to divorce themselves from it, but they want to know if a scene works on its own merits dramatically before they resort to music to solve a problem that maybe they didn't solve in the original photography. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so it's I, a gut check thing. And right. then, they, then you start laying in yeah. music if you think you need music to help the emotional content of a scene. And then, of course, you'd edit to a cue and find those rhythms yeah. or sound. Yeah. So I have, I have kind of a personal question. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's, a smaller, it's a smaller project that you worked on. Um, the BMW <laughs> spots. How did so, that come up? Uh, well, <laughs> I was a big homework. fan of them. Well, it's, it's not even that. Is It was 2000. Two, when, I can't remember when those came out, the original ones, uh, 2004. Remember. Anyways, a long time ago. But you worked on those, and then mm. now, you, uh, 2017, 2016, they redid them, or redid one yeah. with, with uh, Clive Owen. Yeah. Uh, how is it kind of coming back to that universe, if you will, after the 15 years on uh, – Basically, there's these there's these BMW short films that are kind of like the Transporter series in a way, where uh, Clive Owen's character is always he's got something different to do per per episode. But uh, how is it like coming back to that series after it being so long? I, weird, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I, I didn't know that that would ever happen again. Um, you know, they're they're fun because. Arguably, the the BMW and the and the filmmaking team want something exciting, and that th those are a group of people that recognize how important sound is to cinema and and media consumption, as well as the excitement of their product. Right. So they're they're great fans to, yeah, <laughs> to have sure. behind you at, at your sound mix and your design presentations, because they're always rooting for sound to be part of the to be a big player in what you're doing. So um, though, though they're just exciting and, and they're, you know, they're so digestible. They're only eight minutes, seven and a half minutes right, long or right. something like that. And, you know, they, they like to spend money to get it right. And you get to go out and record the vehicles. and. So, yeah, you're doing the them. actual BMW, the M5s or whatever it was in the in Well, the on the first uh, short I did, I was the sound designer. On the second one, I was the re-recording mixer, and Dave Whitehead, one of the world's great uh, supervising sound editors, sound designers, sound recordists, um, he did all the sound prep, and I just did the mix. Okay, yeah. Um, so I didn't get to go record that BMW, but I did record the Z4, which was the first one okay, that I had yeah. done, which was really fun. Yeah, I, I didn't bring you out to, to uh, <laughs> Nuremberg Ring at the, the uh, track. We and did it locally. It might have been at um, one of the less used airport runways that we hire for doing vehicle records. Gotcha. I, I can't remember which one. Yeah, I did, yeah. I, That was done with Eric Potter, who actually recorded that Z4. Yeah, those are fun to get yeah. out yeah. for the day. I, the, I had yeah. to bring it up because it was I was I was early in my my knowing that I wanted to be a filmmaker. And those came out and I was like, wow, this is this is a car company doing these short right. films like it was incredible for the time. There wasn't really anything else like it. Right. Um, and now to see just how Adidas and, and everybody has these short films online now. And yeah. it's just been this big, you know, uh, renaissance in a lot of ways for for just everyone. Um, but speaking of like the digital uh, options, what is it like now? Um library wise like are you i mean you're still making your own sounds obviously constantly. yeah constantly. constantly but what are you um what do you see as uh, i don't know where i'm going with this but maybe like the future of sound design um in the sense of people just downloading libraries or do you think um you, i mean you have the odyssey collection which <laughs> is do. huge and yeah. um like do you think that would be enough for a lot of people or the, the, will, there, will there always be Foley artists and, and things like that in this world? That, that's really driven by the project. Look, that that has been my library for 40 years and it's it serves me well. When I don't 
get the time and budgets that I get on a Denis Villeneuve project or a George Miller project. I can rely on a really good library to, to, to fully complete a job. So, um, yes, one can. And what didn't exist 40 years ago when I started was the, 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 the ubiquity of great sound recording. Mm, when sure. I first started... Sound libraries weren't very high fidelity, even mm. for the day. Yeah. And it wasn't common practice to go out and record. Now that that's all shifted. And even, I think, on uh, budgets like uh, television series, sound artists are out recording because they just know the importance of having fresh sound, the importance that it has in, in making a fresh track. So, And, and also, too, because the, the, the equipment has become democratized. It's so much, you can go out with a little Zoom yeah, right, right. recorder for $100 yeah. and capture something pretty great at no great expense. You couldn't do that 40 years ago. You needed a $15,000 Nagra. Sure, it was yeah. cost prohibitive. So um, times have kind of changed and the technology's changed the, the quality of what we do. Everything's stepped up. But, uh, you know, I, I, I can't go against what I've been advocating for my entire career, which is, just as in in cuisine, the freshest ingredients make the most delicious dishes. Mm. You know, uh, no self-respecting yeah, chef analogy, yeah. would put canned peas yep. <laughs> in their dish. <laughs> sure. So, too, would I endeavor not to put canned dog barks <laughs> <laughs> right. in my film? Right. Sometimes that is necessary. I can't always go out and record F-18s landing on an aircraft sure. carrier. I might have to rely on library sounds for some things. But when, when, whenever and wherever I can, I'm always, my first instinct will always be record. And, you know, that's something I do that uh, maybe to my own detriment, if I don't have a budget for it, you can see the gear around my oh, studio. Yeah, yeah, and this right, is yeah. isn't a half of it. Yeah. Weekend, nights and weekends, I'm not getting paid for it, but I have so much pride in my work that I will still go and record sure. things because I love doing it and I know the value it has to my projects. It's not good advice to people who want to have a family life <laughs> right. and be a right. professional. <laughs> yeah. So right. take that with a grain of salt. Find yeah. your work-life balance. Yeah. Really important. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think you've done that really well, um, just so I say that. And because uh, we know your family and and <laughs> um, and they're, they're, you've, you've done an amazing job even just parenting you know, you. and, and balancing that, I mean, to the level that, that your career has taken you, a lot of people that would have consumed, but, but you've, you've well, been I, able I, to look, find, you've been able to find I've missed my share balance. of PTA meetings. <laughs> well, I, yeah, who I, wants I, to go to a PTA <laughs> meeting? <laughs> I, it's a great way to get out of work. <laughs> but thank you for that. Yeah. Eric. I appreciate that. It's been a constant struggle to be as good a dad as I can be, but and also pursue my goals as a professional, it's it's a constant struggle. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'll tell you a funny story about that though. Um, my children have not been spared the microphone. Right, uh, they've oh, been spared right. the rod, but not yeah, spared the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> and all of them are in the sounds of them are in all of my movies. Yeah, and so Joe Dante, who's a director, a, a near and dear friend, who I've done eight movies for, love his favorite story to tell about me is. When my oldest son, Matthew, uh, was born, I was working on gremlins, and I needed to create the sounds of all the gremlins' voices. So um, Matthew, he was six or seven months old, and he got the croup. And oh. as a father, oh, do yeah. you know what the croup sounds yeah. like? Yeah. It's awful. Your child sounds like yeah. they are dying. You yeah. are sure at any moment the throat will obstruct. Just <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these, these death rattles. Right. Well, yeah. I recorded that. Of course. Oh, well. yeah. Of course you did. <laughs> because they were great for dying gremlin sure, sounds. And yeah. that's what you hear. Oh, my gosh. Stripe, <laughs> that's what I use for stripe dying in the fountain at the end of gremlins. Oh, wow. So, you know, Joe wanted to know, Mark, what's that sound? Yeah. And I told him, it's, it's mm. my son with the croup. Well, I... I would later hear him recount this story to friends saying, oh, yeah, you know, I have Mangini working on the movie. You know what he did? He put his kid out on the doorstep at night and hosed him down and left him there overnight <laughs> and gave him the crew so he could get the right sound for the movie. <laughs> uh, loves to tell that story. The dedication. Yeah, you yeah know? the dedication. Yeah, yeah. We'll embellish it a little not bit. Not true. Just for storytelling. Did not leave right? my son on the doorstep overnight. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I, was, I was looking at... Um, 
a clip or a trailer that you had posted about um, cages uh-huh. and was really excited about just the the humanitarian effort there on really making a difference. Yeah. Cause for, for me, what really made, I had been in production on a number of different levels, but when I, when I went to El Salvador in 2011 and we filmed this team of people that were, that drilled a clean water well for this small village and they were making a difference. And that's when I knew I wanted to do film. I mean, mm. the, I, I was 40 something at the time. Hey, and, late bloomer. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I realized at that point, it's like, this is what I want to do. I want to create films that inspire people, right. and that change that change people's lives and that help. That's why we love make, filmmaking. That yeah. make the world a better place. Yeah. And when I stumbled on that, I was like, oh, this is, this is fantastic. Yeah, that's this what is, it's all about. This is huge. So is there, is that project, is that something that you, is it? How, where are you in the process with that particular? Well, um, unfortunately, after three years of development of the script and shooting the short and uh, pitching to investors, you know, that, that that's an arduous process. We had a, an investor ready to fund this who just backed out. I mean, mm. just a few months ago, he's had some financial difficulties and the writer and I are just taking a rest right now. You know, we'd, we'd been actively soliciting investors and we were close and now we're not so close. And it's a shame because it's a it's a passion project for he and I. It'll be my first directing gig. Right, that'll and, be cool. And, uh, you know, we, we both feel as though this is a cause that we need to shine a light on, that, yes. you know, our, our penal system doesn't work and we don't rehabilitate and we want to sort of show this is this is the state of our penal system. Right. And, the, the, uh, you know, rehabilitation and, and reincarceration is a problem. And uh, we we wrote and we're going to make a dramatic film. It isn't a message movie, but in a way it is because you, you couldn't help but walk away from it and think, I had no idea that's what happens in right. prisons. Yeah. And that's our way of trying to motivate people to take on a cause. And we had always imagined that the various support groups, um, you know, the did you know that the highest suicide rate in the United States is among um, correctional facilities officers, COs. Well, I did not know that. No, I didn't know uh, that either. So it, it, there's all sorts of um, important causes that we, and there's support groups around, uh, allied around them that we hoped we could uh, uh, rejoin and, and, you know, make part of the movement. But um, we lost our funding. So right. we're not shooting this fall as we had hoped we would be. I'm on this movie about sand. And so right. if we can find <laughs> sure. the movie and anyone out here who listens to this, you can go to my my website, markmangini.com, and you can see the clip of Cages. It's also on Vimeo. Yep. And if you're inspired, contact us. If you think you know someone who this is a cause for prison reform, who might be interested in helping us, we need to raise $600,000. That's yeah. our budget, yeah. production budget. Let's do it because this definitely is something that I, I would, I'm i excited about just seeing you in the director role in this particular, but even on a, a greater scale, changing something that isn't working. Yeah. And, and there's a line in that, in that uh, trailer in the short where you had said something to the effect of, You'll you'll know the health of the society by right. looking at their, their prison system. Their prison <clears throat> system, exactly right. And that that was very poignant. And I was in it. It was a punch right in the gut. And it was like, okay, we we do need to shine lights on these areas that yeah. otherwise people aren't aren't learning about. They're not. So let's do it, guys. Let's raise the six hundred k. We can make this happen. We'll 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 start a crowdfunding. Yeah, whatever I was going to say. Yeah, have, have you make it happen? Have, has the Kickstarter idea been been brought it is, up it, for it? It just it? came yeah. up because for about a year we've had the funding in place, and then it disappeared. So sure. now we're thinking, yeah, maybe it is a crowdfunding. Yeah. Uh, project because this topic seems to be getting more and more it's very in topical. the front you know because I mean you have um, people like Bernie Sanders talking about it a lot yeah. and, um, and for profit institutions mm-hmm. taking over the, 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 the correctional system right. yes right it's all problematic yeah I think uh, this is such a great cause I mean yeah I, I would love to talk more about this um, how, how did you get 
into this topic? Like what, what kind of brought you towards this? Was somebody, a friend of yours and had an experience and then brought it to you? Or was it just something you kind of stumbled upon? In an odd way, um, my youngest son is a very gifted actor and pianist, and his manager's husband is a very well-known character actor, uh, William Stanford Davis. And um, we're good friends, and he'd asked me, you know, Mark, what does the next 10 years look like for you? I think you should be a director. Mm. And I said, you know, I've always dreamed about it, but I just have never acted on it. And he asked me, if you wanted to direct something, what would it be? And I said... It wouldn't be a superhero movie. It would have to be something that I feel as though made a difference in the world. Yeah. I want to make movies that move people. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's important to me. So, you know, years went by after that discussion. Then one day he rung me and he said, I have a project for you. Um, I want you to read this script. We think you're the person to direct this. It had just gone into production in, in Toronto, and the writer hated the director. Oh, wow. And stopped production and said, this director's not making the movie I want to make. I want to find somebody new. And um, uh, Stan thought of me, a sound designer, as the right person for him. And then, you know, one thing led to another. Three years later, we're this close to, we, we shot the short, we rewrote, shot the short, and um, hopefully we'll still make this film. But it, once I read that, I loved the script because it was good and dramatic. And I think right. it, it's a pop, it's still a movie anyone could go see and enjoy as a movie, but it also has a message if you want to take that from it. Sure. And might, we right. could do some good with it yeah. if it gets made. Completely. Well, absolutely. I mean, it, ta tackling a poor part of what it, the subject matter is the, the mental health. That's and, what and that's a the writer, huge uh, thing right now. Has spent most of his career in the correction system, wow. counseling. What's it's called cages because, and very few people know this. Um, when the state of California several years ago, and I should know this fact, mandated um, um, psychological uh, therapy for the most disturbed prisoners, prisoners that you know with. Um, uh, uh, mental disorders, and you have to administer help to these these you know um, these challenged prisoners, and um, cages refers to these phone booth sized um, um, prison cells, literally you know like Superman would go into. They're three feet by three feet, and you are administer. And the psychologist or psychiatrist is meant to deliver or administer one of the most human things we can do with each other is try to help another person yeah. separated by a cage the size of a phone booth. Yeah, it's shocking it's, when you see these that yeah. human beings are subjected to this. Wow. It's all about mental. He's been administering this therapy to the mentally challenged in the correction system for 20 years. And this is his personal story wow. of how dysfunctional it really is and how we're not helping people in spite of well-intentioned laws like this. Yeah, I mean, what what a heavy subject and and I hope yeah, I hope it does get get made. Like Thanks. I mean, such a great message to kind of you say there isn't a message, but yeah, I mean, it, it's something that people need to be made and much bring more it aware full of. full circle. <laughs> Who's going to play the nurse ratchet that you want to punch <laughs> in the face, right? Is, yeah. Because, like, um, I mean, that was, that we was a mental health. We just started casting our, our nurse ratchet. We do have a nurse ratchet. Oh, oh, oh sure, like this. sure. Yeah. We have the corrupt uh, correctional officer. Uh, okay, yeah. Mark, it's been such a pleasure being able to come and hang out with you and reconnect you. after a number of years and then and talk through this. I and mean, we, one of the big things that we really want to do is help promote whatever it is that you're doing. Yep, yep. So w even though we can't tell anybody right now what the Sand movie is all about, <laughs> we are going to definitely be promoting that. Um, as well as the 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 can no, you can say it. I, yeah, I, the can, I, it's, the can, it's not yeah. like a big secret. It's Dune. <laughs> sure, um, yeah. But uh, I just can't no, tell us anything about there's it. There's no secret about it being made. Yeah. but I can't tell you anything. Uh, sure. Uh, one question, real quick: is is has principal photography wrapped on that, or are you still in the middle of still in principal photography? Okay. okay. I wasn't. I wasn't sure when they started that. I knew it was pretty recently, though. Right. Um, and as with. Um, Blade Runner 2049, Theo is on location. Okay. Designing sound for Joe Walker and Denis as they shoot and informing that process. That's incredible. As every director should yeah. embrace. 
he's one of my favorites right now. And it just goes to show like he's he's thinking of these processes early on. And, and that's why he's one of the best, I think, out there right now. Well, think yeah. about the value it can have. It, it, it's, it's self-evident. In fact, there's a lot of things in yep. the film that don't exist in reality right. that visual effects has to create. Mm. We're going to lead that charge in the animation model by creating sound first. And perhaps if the sound is evocative enough, visual effects will, in fact, animate to what sound did first. Sure. How, how great is that? Yeah, yeah that's it's, awesome. Yeah. There's a concept. That's yeah. awesome. That's really cool. Working together. I think you made the reference to the can of beans, but the the Odyssey collection is not just a can of beans. It's 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 forty four years of of field recording and creating these sounds. So if you are in the filmmaking space and you're getting you you're not sure where to turn, start there. And it, get it's a great. It's library. my life's yeah. work, and yeah. it, it is in for, in its DNA is designing sound for feature films. So, you know, Richard's and my approach to recording was informed by a love of cinema. Uh, so I think it has value in that regard. Absolutely. And it's an insanely, ridiculously low price for what you get. Sure. It, is. I mean, oh, yeah. it took me 40 years to collect it. Yeah. Right. right. You can have it for a couple weeks' salary. Right. So yeah. where, can, uh, where can listeners find that? Yeah, I mean, Obviously online yep. at ProSoundEffects.com. ProSoundEffects.com. Yeah, th that's my guess. And just search uh, Mark Mangie. That's how I found it, at least. Uh, okay. so. yeah, that, the Odyssey, Odyssey Collection. You Odyssey me, collection. you'll yeah. find them. That's true. It, it right. turns out. That's true. Yeah. Uh, where else can, can we find you online? Are you on Instagram or anything? <laughs> I am um, not on Instagram. My wife maintains my Facebook page. Okay. So um, I, because I don't have time for Facebook. Sure. So anything that I do that's of significance, she'll post for me. She does all my Twitter feed. Um, I do have a website, markmangini.com, that is chock-a-block full uh, a, 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 a lot of information, photographs, and a blog that I'm very passionate about with 40 years of musings on what we do. Yeah, And I, I, I add to that blog every month. So that, that's a good place to go to understand my philosophy about sound. Yeah, I checked out a couple of your recent ones. I mean, some really great stuff there. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, make sure to check that out, markmangini.com. And uh, Dune is next year, I believe, is <laughs> yeah, the release? Uh, November 2020. Okay, 2020 all right. So we got a little bit, the... but, yeah, I'd be on the lookout for that. And then uh, what is – is there a title for the um, – Ben Affleck? It, it, there, it, the working title is Torrance, but that okay. was always a working title because everyone knew that wasn't going to be the title, okay. and we have not landed on it yet. But it, it's a, a beautiful film that has a release date in October, October from Warner Brothers, and it's a really moving, powerful film. Awesome. Worth seeing, certainly. Yeah. So check that out in October. And uh, thanks for listening, guys. Mark, thank you yeah. again for, for doing Zach. this. Thanks, Mark. It's Eric, been great. Thank you. So thank you for taking sound so seriously that oh. you want to talk about it for an hour. It's, of course. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Well, Eric, we've been doing this podcast for a, almost a year now. Yeah. And something that we've never pushed for is subscribers. That's right. We just want to bring value. Yeah. But you know what also brings value? What? More episodes. Sure. So please hit that subscribe button on whatever platform yep. you're listening on, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Google Play, or Anchor. Hit that subscribe button. And uh, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can go over to anchor.fm slash the easy podcast and, you know, throw, throw some money our way. Yeah. For no. less than a cup of coffee, you know. I don't actually know if that's true. No. But, yeah, they have like a subscription thing. Anyway, check it out. Anchor. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can support it for less than a – or you can support it for a dollar a month. I mean – yeah. That would be awesome. That would help us to continue to bring these amazing podcasts to you. And if you guys have liked the interviews we've had, please, uh, you know, write us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I don't know if Spotify has reviews, actually, but Apple Podcasts definitely does. So um, try and write us a review. Just a quick one. Even if you didn't mm -hmm. like it, just, just write us a review. I just want to know what people think. Yeah. It's great. It's fun. We have a lot of fun doing it. And uh, and it'll help us make it better. It's true. I mean, we want to make it better. We want to bring value. We want to, you know. There's that V word again. Keep saying value. Yeah, because, you know, that's what people pay for. And it's important. Yeah. So hit that subscribe button, guys, and support the podcast if you can. And we'll keep bringing you awesome interviews. Eric, where can they find us online, though? They can find us online at anchor.fm slash the easy podcast or 
any of their favorite streaming platforms. We're also on Instagram and Twitter at The Easy Podcast. And uh, we're going to have some content coming up on YouTube. So search at The Easy Podcast Show on YouTube soon. And, and if- you can send us an email at The Easy Podcast Show at gmail.com. He can never say it normal. Because it doesn't come out normal. It's fun. Yeah, it'll be fun. Thanks, guys. 